Hi, my name is Paul Grogan, and in this Gaming Rules video, me and my companion Hamish are going to be teaching you how to play Clans of Caledonia, published by Karma Games. During the 19th century, Scotland was transitioning from an agricultural economy to an industrial one, and relied heavily upon trade and export. After the European wine and brandy production was ravaged by a plague of insects, Scotch whisky became the premium alcoholic beverage across the whole of Europe, and the Scotch whisky industry exploded into life. In Clans of Caledonia, players represent unique historical clans competing to produce, trade and export agricultural goods, as well as their famous whisky. The rulebook contains some changes you might want to make for your first game, to make it slightly easier. I'm not going to cover them in this video, I'm just going to cover the full rules of the game, but if you are playing for the first time and you want a slightly simpler version, please refer to the rulebook for these changes. To set up the game, first take the four map modules and randomly choose a side for each one. Then arrange them like this, ensuring that the letters on the rocks in the middle of the map are in alphabetical order going clockwise. Shuffle the port's bonus tiles and randomly choose four of them to use in the game, returning the rest to the box. Place these tiles on the hexes adjacent to the factories at the corners of the board. The exact location of the port tile depends on the number of players in the game. So in a one or two player game, place it here next to this icon. And with three to four players, place it here next to the arrow, even if that means placing it off the board. Place the market board on the table, showing the side according to the number of players in the game. Place the six transparent markers on the starting price spaces for each of the six goods. Place the export board on the table, using the side according to the number of players in the game. Shuffle the export contracts and place them in a face down pile. Then, draw and place one export contract face up on each of the boxes on the export board. This icon means that in a three player game, you leave this box empty. Shuffle the scoring tiles and randomly choose five of them to use in the game, returning the rest to the box. Place these tiles face up randomly in the five slots at the edge of the export board. Place the import tokens for cotton, tobacco and sugarcane nearby. Each player chooses a colour and takes a player board and pieces in that colour. On your player board, place the following tokens. Sheep, cows, cheese dairies, bakeries, fields, distilleries, woodcutters and miners. The woodcutters and miners are referred to as workers. Place five cubes on your merchant track here and place the remaining two cubes just below your player board. These are the merchants that you have at the start of the game. Place your shipping token at the start of your shipping track and place the two technology tiles in the respective spaces below the workers. Make sure that they are this way up, with the arrow in the top left corner. Place the four port markers in your colour near your player board, and take an export box and place it face up beside your board, showing the side according to the number of players in the game. Determine a start player randomly and place their turn order token on the first space of the turn order track. Place the other player's tokens on there in clockwise order from the start player. This will be the turn order for the first round of the game. Randomly draw one clan tile per player in the game plus one and place them face up on the table. So four tiles for a three player game. Then for each clan tile, draw a random starting tile and place it face up next to the clan tile. Starting with the last player and going in reverse player order, each player chooses a clan and its corresponding starting tile, taking them and placing them near their player board. Your clan will give you a special ability that you can use during the game. For the full details of all of these, please refer to the rulebook. Players then receive the goods shown on their starting tile. So if you chose this one, you would start with one wool, one cheese, 55 pounds, and then an additional five pounds. Finally, players will now place their first workers onto the map. Beginning with the starting player and going in turn order, each player will place one worker, either a woodcutter or miner, onto a space on the board. Then, beginning with the last player and going in reverse turn order, each player places a second worker onto the board, which may or may not be adjacent to the first one. You therefore start the game with either two woodcutters, two miners, or one of each. When you place pieces on the board, certain rules apply. First of all, there can only ever be one piece per space. Second, woodcutters can only go onto spaces that show a forest, and miners can only go onto spaces that show mountains. This space, for example, could either have a woodcutter or a miner because it shows both terrains. And finally, placing a piece on a space costs you a certain amount of money. The cost is the sum of the space itself added to the cost of the type of worker you place. £6 for woodcutters and £10 for miners.
So placing a miner here would cost you £16. And you're now ready to start playing the game. The game is divided into five rounds, and each round consists of four phases. At the end of the fifth round, the points are added up and the player with the highest total wins the game. Phase one is preparation, and you actually skip this phase in the first round of the game, so I'm going to explain this later on. Phase two is the main part of the game, and players will take it in turns to perform actions. The different actions you can do include trading with the market, placing new pieces on the board, fulfilling contracts, and so on. After all players have passed in Phase 2, the game proceeds to Phase 3, which is production, where everything you have on the map produces goods. Your cows produce milk, for example, which you could then turn into cheese at a cheese dairy. And finally, in Phase 4, each player has the opportunity to gain glory based on the scoring tile for that round. I'll now explain each of the phases in more detail. As mentioned earlier, you will skip this phase in the first round of the game. In later rounds, do the following. Flip over the previous round scoring tile. Then, if needed, refill any empty boxes on the export board, remembering to leave this box empty in a three-player game. Each player then takes back any merchants they have from the market and places them back below their player board. This phase of the game is played in turn order, and each player on their turn performs one of the following actions as shown on the player aid. This process repeats until all players have passed. Over the course of a round, each player may perform the same action multiple times on different turns, with the exception of the pass action. Once you pass, the action phase is over for you for this round. Action 1 Trade When you choose this action, you can send any number of your available merchants to the market to either buy or sell one type of good. The cost to buy and sell each good is depicted by the transparent marker. Each merchant you send to the market allows you to buy or sell one unit of that type of good. So for example, if you wanted to purchase two cheese, you would place two merchants here. This would cost you £20, £10 for each cheese. After buying, the price of the good rises by a number of spaces equal to the number of goods bought. So in this case, the price of cheese rises to 12. If you sell goods, the price drops by the same method. You can only buy or sell one type of good per action. So if you wanted to, for example, buy one wool and sell one whiskey, you could do that, but it would be two different actions. You may not have merchants on both the buy and sell areas of the same good in the same round, because high-speed trading was not common in 19th century Scotland. Merchants placed on the market will usually remain there until the preparation phase of the next round, unless returned through some ability. I'll explain in a later action how you get more merchants. Action 2. Obtaining a new export contract your export box next to your player board has space for one export contract, and if that box is empty, you can take an export contract from the export board by choosing this action. The cost of taking a contract depends on the current round number, and is shown here. Note that in round one, you actually gain £5 for doing this. This is represented by the number being in black, which means you get the money, rather than in red, which means you have to spend the money. Take any of the contracts on display and place it on your export box. And you can only have one unfulfilled contract at any time. I'll explain later on how you fulfill them. Action 3. Expand. This action allows you to take the top unit of one of the columns of pieces on your player board and place it onto the map. Like when you placed pieces on the map at the start of the game, placing a unit onto the map costs a certain amount of money. This cost is equal to the cost shown on the space added to the cost of the specific piece that you want to place but there are limitations on where you can place the unit on the map. It can only be placed either neighbouring one of your existing units, which means an adjacent space with no river in between, or within shipping reach of one of your units, and I'll explain shipping reach later on. There's also restrictions based on the terrain of the space. Again, woodcutters can only go where there are forests, and miners can only go where there are mountains. All other units can only be placed where there is grassland. And remember, there can only be one unit per space in total. If you expand into a space that is neighbouring another player's unit, and remember, neighbouring means adjacent with no river in between, you get an immediate one-time neighbourhood bonus. This allows you to immediately buy up to three units of that type of good produced by the unit that you've built next to, four pieces in a two-player game. This buying of goods is performed like a normal trade, and you must place merchants in the space with the up arrow of the good that you're buying but you get a discount of £2 per good for the basic goods, wool, grain and milk, 
and three pounds per good for the processed goods, bread, cheese, and whiskey. You buy your goods from the common supply. The other player does not get anything out of the trade. And for each good that you buy, the price rises by one as normal. If you expand into a space that is neighboring multiple units of other players, you can use the neighborhood bonus of each of those units, assuming you have enough merchants available. So if you placed a unit here, for example, you could buy up to three cheese and three whiskey, as long as you've got the available merchants. Remember that this is a one-time bonus only, done at the point where you expand next to another player's unit. It's not a permanent ability that you can use during the game. Your player board has four of each type of unit. When you place the last piece of one of the buildings, cheese dairy, bakery, or distillery, and your export box is empty, you can draw three export contracts from the face down pile, and then you may choose one of them and place it on your export box. If you do choose to keep one of the contracts, you have to pay the cost according to the current round number, just like when you took an export contract as an action. The contracts you don't choose are removed from the game. Action four, upgrade shipping. In the previous action, I mentioned that you can expand into a space on the map as long as it's within your shipping reach. Your shipping marker shows the current level of your shipping reach, and at the start of the game, it's on the leftmost space, meaning that you cannot expand over any type of water. By taking this action and spending four pounds, you move your shipping marker forward one space. When it's here, you can expand directly across a river into an adjacent space, like this. When it's here, you can also expand across one lock space. For example, you could expand from here to here. Each level of shipping allows you to expand across more lock spaces. Note, however, that no matter what your level of shipping, you cannot jump over land spaces, not even along a river. For example, even if you had two lock shipping, you could not expand into here or here. Action five, upgrade technology. Your woodcutters and miners will produce income for you in phase three. In order for them to produce more income, you can upgrade their tools and make them work more efficiently. To do this, you pay 10 pounds and flip over one of the technology tiles on your player board. You'll see that this increases the income by two pounds per worker that you have on the map. Action six, hire a merchant. This is a very simple action. You pay four pounds and move one cube from your merchant track into your supply. You can now use this merchant for any future trade actions. Action seven, fulfill an export contract. I already mentioned two ways that you can get an export contract into your export box. Each export contract depicts what you need to pay on the left side and what you get in return on the right side. Once you have the goods shown on the left, you can take this action to fulfill that contract. You simply return back to the supply the goods shown on the left. An export contract that requires beef or mutton can only be fulfilled by slaughtering cows or sheep respectively. To do this, you remove the animal from the map and place it back on your player board. Note that this will reduce your milk and wool production, but it does free up the space on the board for something else. You then get the rewards printed on the right side of the export contract, which is a combination of import goods and direct export bonuses. Import goods are hops, sugarcane, tobacco, and cotton. You do not take any tokens for these import goods. Instead, at the end of the game, each of your import goods on your fulfilled export tiles will be worth points. When you fulfill an export contract that rewards you with cotton, tobacco, or sugarcane, move the respective token on the export board track that number of spaces forward. This is a running total of the number of that type of good that has been imported during the game by all players, and it will be important during end of game scoring. If the token reaches or passes a space with this icon, you gain one pound. There are three types of direct export bonuses. Some contracts show money, which you gain immediately. This icon allows you to immediately take an expand action in exactly the same way as if you'd chosen to expand, with the only exception being that you do not pay the cost for the space that you place your unit. And finally, this icon is a bonus upgrade action, and you have three choices. You can upgrade either your woodcutter or mining technology at a cost of five pounds instead of 10, or you could upgrade your shipping at no cost, or you can hire a merchant for free. Alternatively, instead of hiring a merchant, you can take one of your merchants back from the market. After fulfilling a contract, place it to the side of your export box. It will be worth points during final scoring. Action eight, pass. On your turn, if you cannot or do not want to take any more actions, then you must pass. Once you do this, the action phase is over for you this round. 
When you pass, you must move your turn order token to the leftmost available position on the track for the next round, and take the money indicated. So, the earlier you pass, the more money you'll get, and the sooner you'll get to take your turns in the next round. This also means that turn order after round one may not be in a clockwise order. In addition to taking one of the eight actions on your turn, you can also use the bonus of a port tile if it is either neighbouring or within shipping reach of any of your units on the map. Each port tile can only be used once in the game by each player, and when you use it, place one of your port markers next to it to indicate that you've used it and cannot use it again this game. When you use a port, simply get what is printed on it. This one, for example, gives you either a beef or a mutton. And now it's time to find out why you've been placing all of those things on the map. In phase three, everything on the map produces. Look at your player board. Every empty slot produces income or goods, because if a slot is empty, it means that piece is on the map. Each deployed woodcutter earns you four pounds, or six pounds if their tools have been upgraded. And each deployed miner earns you six pounds, or eight pounds if their tools have been upgraded. The number boxes on your player board allow you to easily see how much income you get. In this case, I have one woodcutter with basic tools, so that earns me four pounds, and I have three miners with upgraded tools, so that earns me 24 pounds. So I gain 28 pounds in total. Each sheep produces one wool, each cow produces one milk, and each field produces two grain. After you have produced your basic goods, wool, milk and grain, you may optionally choose to turn any basic goods in your stock, including ones that you've gained this round, into processed goods. Each cheese dairy may turn one milk into one cheese, each bakery may turn one grain into one bread, and each distillery may turn one grain into one whiskey. In this phase, you look at the scoring tile for the current round. Any player that meets the requirement shown in the top half gains glory points as shown in the bottom half. The glory points are tracked by players moving their glory tokens on the track on the export board. And glory points will contribute to your final score. After five rounds of play, it's time to add up the scores, and you do this by using the score pad provided. First, you score one point for each glory you have, as shown on the export track. Then, you score one point for each basic good in your stock, milk, grain and wool. You score two points for each processed good you have, cheese, bread and whiskey. Every full ten money you have scores you one point. And then, you look at your fulfilled export contracts. Each hop listed gains you one point. For the other three imports, you first need to work out how rare each one is. This is determined by the positions of the tokens on the track here. The most common type of import good, the one that was imported the most, in this case cotton, is worth three points each. The second most common type of import good, in this case tobacco, is worth four points each. And the rarest import good, the one that was imported the least, in this case sugarcane, is worth five points each. There is also bonus points for the player or players who fulfilled the most and second most contracts, depending on the number of players in the game. If there is a tie, add the points together and divide. So in a three-player game, if two players are tied for the most, they both get nine points. And finally, there is a settlement scoring. Each player counts the number of settlements that they have that are within shipping reach of each other. A settlement is defined as a cluster of neighbouring units owned by one player, and this could be a single unit. For example, here I have four settlements. These two here are separate settlements because they're divided by a river. If I have two lock shipping, then these three settlements are all within shipping reach of each other. My two lock shipping is not enough to connect this settlement with the other three, so this settlement is not counted for final scoring. Once each player has worked out how many settlements they have connected, points are given out according to the numbers shown on the bottom of the export box. So in a three and four player game, that is 18 points for whoever has the most, 12 for second and six for third. Ties are resolved in the same way as you did for ties on export contracts. During setup, I mentioned that each player gets one clan. This clan gives you a special ability that you can use during the game. The abilities of these clans will affect the actions that you take in the game and the strategy that you might use to achieve victory. The clans are all fully explained in the appendix at the back of the rulebook, along with full details of the port bonus tiles and the scoring tiles. 
There are rules included for a two-player game where you use a smaller map as shown by these shaded spaces here. There are also full solo rules included where you're trying to score as many points as you can. And there are also other variants such as playing on a tighter map or auctioning off the clans at the start of the game. I hope you found this video useful in learning how to play Clans of Caledonia. For more of my videos, please consider subscribing to my channel. And if you have any questions or rules queries about the game, then please let me know in the comments below. Until next time, take care, thanks for watching, and enjoy your game.